All right, I'll start with a question. What do you know about electrons? It's a fairly general question, so what do you know about them? They're negatively charged particles. They're negatively charged particles. Yep. What else do you know about them? They're in matter. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, close, yeah. Um, you you can't observe their um, speed or momentum and and position at the same time. But yeah, um, that's actually true for any small particle like that moving at a high speed, not necessarily just an electron. But yeah, um, what about how they interact with each other? Do you know anything about that? Have you heard? Yeah. Yeah, um, well, let's start there. When we talked last time about a little bit about the structure of the atom, we came to the conclusion, following some history, that you basically had a small, positively charged mass in the center that we called the nucleus, and that was primarily made up of what? Well, entirely made up of what? Protons and neutrons, neutrons right? And then you had the electrons around there. And in any free neutral atom, the number of protons has to equal the number of electrons. So that, the char so that they balance out. Protons are plus, or electrons are minus, so they have to have the same amount. So that, um, that gives us a structure, and we drew something on the board kind of like this, where you had your protons and your neutrons in the center in the nucleus, and then you had electrons kind of going around the outside. Um, and we said that, that was, that's the original planetary model of the nucleus. Kind of assumes that the nucleus is like a uh, that an atom is like a planet with a center, central nucleus and, and uh, electrons orbiting around it. We know now that's not exactly the case, um, but it can still be a useful way to understand things. So what we say instead now is that there are still protons and neutrons in the nucleus, but there's sort of just electrons around the nucleus in various places. And they're not really orbiting around. They're just sort of occupying the space around the nucleus in various ways. OK. In high school, we, I vaguely remember this. So OK. Out. Yeah. What, were people still using the planetary orbiting idea? And like, you had to like fill up the different yeah. orbits before you could go on the next one? Mm -hmm. Did you still do that? Yeah. Um, in a way. So let's talk about that. You may have seen something like this. So you've got a, uh, you might put the nucleus here. And then you'd say, OK, there's these, there's these like shells that come out of the nucleus. So you've got the first shell, and then the second shell, and the third shell. And the electrons are kind of in there. Is that kind of what you've seen before? No. No, OK. Um, it was like the first OK, so OK. Right, right, right. So you saw something like this. And this one had uh, two electrons. And this one, right, and it had eight. Yep, exactly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this one could have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight also. Sometimes we say 18, or, or no, that's the third. That's eight also. Yeah, um, this is called the Bohr model of the atom. And from a physical standpoint, it's not correct. Um, the, the electrons don't occupy orbits at specific distances from the uh, nucleus. But from a understanding the structure or understanding how the electrons behave model, this is actually OK. Um, so you'll notice those numbers that we came up with, 2, 8, and 8, you'll notice they also appear on the far right of the periodic table. The first row has something like 2. Then the second row, it says 2, 8, then 2, 8, 8. So there's something sort of right about this. And today we're, we're actually going to go through this and talk about what's right and what's wrong here. Um, 
So as a way to understanding where the electrons go, this is actually OK. And, and we will use this. So we'll talk about the first shell. and the second shell, and the sh third shell. But actually, as we get into it, we're going to start to find out that that's not totally physically the correct thing that happens. But, but it works. right? It's a model that works so we can understand some things. All right, so the first shell, the first group of electrons away from the nucleus, there can, there's only space for two of them. And this actually gives rise to the organization of our periodic table. So you have hydrogen, element number one, that has one electron. And then you have helium, number two. Since that's all that fits in the first shell, we call that the first shell elements, or the first row elements, or the n equals one elements, or always, to describe that. And then we have to move to the next one, and we go down to the next row. So lithium has one electron, and then beryllium has two. And now we have some more space. So we go boron has three, carbon has four, nitrogen has five, six, seven, whatever. But here's the thing. They still have those electrons from before as well. So go back to what we talked about last time, atomic structure. How many total electrons does an atom of, let's say, carbon have? Six. Six total, right? Because it has six protons. Let's write that down. We know carbon has six protons. How do we know that? Yeah, because that's the atomic number. <coughs> that defines it as carbon. And so if it's going to be neutral, it must also have six electrons. All right. But now we're going to take that one step further and say those six electrons don't all, aren't all at the same level. It's sort of a 2 plus 4. 2 go in that inside one, and then 4 go in the outside one. And we have names for those, which you may have heard before. The ones that are in the inside that are closest into the nucleus, anybody know what those are called? Those are called the core electrons. And they're not important. Well, OK. They're important. Sorry, I don't mean to offend any core electrons. But they don't do chemistry. <coughs> and when I say they don't do chemistry, what does that mean? Yeah, they don't interact with anything else. They sit there, they're part of the atom, but they don't go do anything with any other atoms. So then these must be the important ones. What are those called? the valence electrons. And those are the ones that do the chemistry. So then an important task of ours is going to be determining how many valence electrons a given atom has. And you may have talked about this a little bit on Tuesday. Um, there's sort of a hard and an easy way to do this. Let's look at the, I guess not hard, but let's look at the, let's look at the first way, slightly more time consuming way. So the first way to do it is to figure out how many uh, electrons the atom has overall, and then count up in the shells and, and see which ones are on the outside. So let's do an example. Carbon was kind of an easy one. Let's do a bigger one. Let's do silicon, element 14. So that has 14 protons and 14 electrons. And we want to know how many valence electrons. So to figure that out, we start counting these shells. We know the first shell only holds two. So it's two, 
The second shell holds eight. How did we know that? Well, you can count up the, um, the, uh, the atoms here. Of course, there are rules behind this. There are reasons behind why there's only eight. But I think that's a little bit beyond the scope of the class. If you're curious, please come talk to me and we'll, we'll discuss it. But it goes two, eight, and eight, as you may have heard before. So we go two plus eight, and then that leaves us with four left. So there must be four. So then these must be the core. And these must be the valence. Okay. Those are the ones that we care about. So silicon has four valence electrons. Now, what's the easier way to do that if you don't want to count each shell? You know? See if you can find any clues on the periodic table. The number that's above it. The number that's above it. Yeah. Yeah, the number that's above it, at least for the A's, tells you the number of valence electrons. That's why they're numbered that way. So anything in group 4A, which is that column there, is going to have four valence electrons. Anything in group 6A is going to have six valence electrons. One thing to also note, if you have, I don't know what your uh, periodic tables look like, there are two numbering systems. One is the A's and the B's. And one is just numbers, 1 through 18. That also works. You just use the second digit. So like instead of column 4A, the other numbering system, that's column 14. So still, it's the 4. So you get four valence electrons. Um, the only time this doesn't really work right is those middle B areas in the metals. Those have their own kind of electronic behavior. Uh, and we're not really going to go into that. So uh, before the, for the others, that absolutely works. All right, let's try a couple. How many valence electrons does nitrogen have? Yeah. How many core electrons does nitrogen have then? Two. So it's the valence electrons. Uh, you subtract the valence electrons from the total number of electrons. Uh, what about bromine? Br, element number 35. How many valence electrons? Seven. 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 And how many core electrons? Two. Careful. How many total electrons are in bromine? 35. So if you've got seven valence, the rest must all be the core. So that's uh, 28, right? I know, subtraction, sorry. Um. And we'll just write here for completeness sake, so 28 core electrons. And that's, that's interesting because um, all those core electrons, and we don't really care about them. The valence ones are what we're going to be talking about exclu exclusively from now on. What about argon, element 18? How many valence electrons? Eight. And what's, what's special about those? Does anybody know? Remember those before? They're, They're full. That's right. Um, as you'll see, a, as we talked about, the first shell can have two, the second, three, or the second eight, and the third eight. So if you fill all those up, you have a special kind of situation. It's also known as an octet, eight valence electrons. And the thing that's special about that is that it is especially stable, lower energy. High energy means reactive, means it'll do stuff. Low energy means stable. Um, and in nature, generally, tends toward the more stable uh, configuration in, in many different ways. Right? Things fall to the ground because uh, they're more stable right? after gravity has worked on them. Um, 
if you stretch something, it relaxes because that's a more stable state. That's kind of just how the world works. Um, and that's the same with electrons. So atoms will do what they need to to try to get eight valence electrons, to try to get eight electrons in that shell. And what are the two ways they can go about doing that? Anybody know? Well, bonding is the, the way in general, yeah. Yeah, there are two types of bonding that we'll talk about. And I'm going to define that. I'm going to define bonding as just trying trying to get full shells. Now bonding means connections, it means atoms connecting together, but the force toward bonding is just that these atoms don't have full valence shells. So we should probably then there full valence shells. And they interact with other atoms in order to get those full shells. So I'll give you a couple examples. One, I know you've talked a little bit about the covalent bonding. In ionic bonding, electrons transfer from one atom to another in a mutually beneficial way. So you might have a sodium atom. How many valence electrons does a sodium atom have? One. And you might have a chlorine atom. <coughs> How many valence electrons does that have? And these can transfer an electron. Now, here's the question. Where does the electron come from, and where does the electron go to, and why? Uh, yeah, it goes from the sodium to the chlorine, because the fewer electrons to transfer. So think about this. Sodium takes its one valence electron and transfers it to the chlorine. What results is a sodium ion and a chloride ion. One way that we can understand this is by putting in little dots uh, signifying the valence electrons. So sodium has one valence electron, so we'll make one dot. Chlorine has seven valence electrons, so we'll make seven dots. All right. Now, if sodium loses its electron, how many valence electrons does it have? Is it none? Well, yeah, sort of. But we have to think back to the definition. The valence electrons are the outermost electrons, right? The ones in the highest shell. So if sodium has zero in its outer shell, well, then that's not really the outer shell anymore, is it? The next one in becomes the outer shell, and that has eight electrons. Okay, So either way, whether you call it zero in the three or eight in the two, uh, it has a full shell now. And chlorine has how many in its valence? Now, I'm sorry, chloride has now eight, because we've added one from the sodium. Okay. So in doing this transfer, Both atoms now have full valence shells. So they went from a less stable situation where they didn't have those stable shells 
to a more stable situation where they did by actually transferring an electron fully from one atom to the other. This is called ionic bonding. And it's a little bit, uh, sometimes it's a little bit confusing because we actually don't write lines. You know how you draw bonds as like a line between two atoms? That's actually inappropriate for ionic bonding because in, in the sodium chloride compound, which is what we have on the left, the atoms don't actually interact with each other. They're just held together by electric forces, electrostatic forces, meaning positive attracts negative, so they like stick together like that. They're not actually interacting in a chemical way. They're not doing anything with those electrons. They're simply stuck together. Um, so we don't draw a line between them. We just say that it's an ionic compound of sodium ions and chloride ions together. Okay. Let's try another one. Let's see if you can do this one. Let's try calcium and oxygen. So what you're going to do is figure out how many valence electrons are in each one. Draw them as dots if you like. And then figure out how many are likely to transfer and from where to where. And what are the new charges of the ions that are produced in the reaction. So see if you can try that out. Um, if you get stuck or you're not sure, ask around at your table and see if anybody else has ideas. Yeah, so let's, let's work that out here. Uh, Calcium has two valence electrons, and oxygen has six, or eight if you're not wearing your glasses. Uh, <laughs> so two will transfer. If calcium loses its two and transfers them over to oxygen, then you have calcium missing two electrons. So what's the charge on calcium if it's missing two electrons? Plus two, or two plus. Um, if you haven't seen this type of notation before, the reason we often say it's 2 plus instead of plus 2 is because, depending on, on your writing, if you write plus 2 and the 2 is off a little bit or something, you like move it away, it, it can look like just plus, which means plus 1. So by putting the 2 first, we're saying here's the 2, then the plus. It's, it doesn't really matter how you write it, but okay. That's why, that's why it's done that way if you haven't seen that. So then oxygen is going to get those two and now be what charge? Negative two or two minus. And how many valence electrons are in the calcium ion? Eight, right? Because it's zero in that shell, but then it jumps back to the next one and has eight. And how many uh, valence electrons are in oxygen? Also eight. So again, we have two full shells. All right. Now what happens in this case? Actually, before we go there, in this previous one, we would call that co compound calcium oxide and we would write it as CaO. So one atom of calcium, one atom of oxygen connected together in that ratio. Positive ions don't change their name. So calcium stays to calcium, sodium stays sodium, so on. Negative ions go from whatever their end is to an I. So chlorine becomes chloride, and oxygen becomes oxide. So this would be called. Calcium oxide. So what happens if you have sodium with oxygen then? We've done let's let's do this together. How many valence electrons are in sodium? One. And how many in oxygen? What happens here then? Sodium gives up one, because it really only has one to give up. But if oxygen only accepts one, it still doesn't have that octet. So what happens? Yeah, so this gets into some stuff that we'll talk about later. But actually, to get this reaction to work, 
you need two atoms of sodium for every one atom of oxygen. So then those electrons can both go to oxygen and you end up with two atoms of sodium and one oxide and so the compound then is written as Na2O to reflect that. It's still called sodium oxide, but now we have two atoms of sodium for one of oxygen. Before we go into covalent bonding then, do you see some patterns on the periodic table of what, which ions are likely to form from which types of atoms? Somebody, uh, what's one that you see? Okay, I guess I, I meant even simpler than that. Like, let me rephrase that. Uh, which atoms would you expect to form plus one ion? Plus one or minus one? Yeah, so let's look back at the stuff we've done here. In these cases, sodium lost one electron because that was its valence electron. So it might make sense then, logically, that any atom with one valence electron is likely to lose it and become a one plus ion. And that's in fact true. So all the group one or group 1A elements They all make plus one ions. And they don't actually make any other ions, at least not under normal circumstances. So hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, all make one plus ions. And when you see a, a chemical formula with those in them, you can assume that they are indeed one plus ions. And a similar thing applies to the group two, but what do they make? Yeah, they usually make plus two ions because that's how they get their full shell. What about group 7A? What do they usually make? Minus one. And then, same things, you can say some, some, some generalities, like the group 6A is generally uh, minus 2. Now, getting away from these three groups, it's not quite so clear. Right. Um, 6A, yes, they're usually minus 2, but not always. Uh, 5A can be minus 3, or actually plus 5. Um, so it's not always as clear. But definitely those that we wrote down, you can count on that those are the common ions of those structures. So why is that important? Well, it allows you to figure out the chemical formula of certain uh, species. So say that I asked you what the formula was for magnesium chloride. Knowing those rules, you can figure this out. And this is how you do it. What's the common ion for magnesium? Plus two. Plus two. And what's the common ion for chloride? Minus one. So you write those down. You say, OK, I've got two plus magnesium and minus one chlorine. So what do I have to do to make those balance each other? have two chlorines, right? So magnesium chloride must be MgCl2. Must have two chlorines for every magnesium so that those charges balance. Let's try another one.
potassium oxide. Potassium, if you don't know, is K, element number 19. See if you can figure that one out. What should that be? K2O. What made you say that? Okay. Yep. Right, so you'll need two potassiums for each of the oxygens. All right. Questions about that? How to do that? Does that seem clear? All right. Well, let me know if, if something comes up. Let's move on and talk about the other type of bonding, covalent. There's actually another, there's, there's a metallic type of bonding too. We're not going to talk about that, but these are the two major ones. Those of you who have heard of covalent bonding before, how would you describe it? There's usually a word that comes up when we talk about covalent bonding. Has anybody heard it before? Okay, good, good, we'll talk about it. Covalent bonding is rather than the transfer of electrons, it's the sharing of electrons. So ionic bonding was transfer of electrons from one atom to the other. Covalent bonding is sharing, and this is the bonding that we're more used to seeing uh, expressed as lines. When you think of a chemical bond like two of atoms connected by a line. This is what we're talking about. So to do this, let's look at hydrogen. How many valence electrons does hydrogen have? One. And how many electrons would hydrogen like to have if it has a full shell? Two, right? Because it can't have eight. There's no room. It's only two in the, in the first row. So one of the things that hydrogen can do as we discuss is it can actually lose its electron and become H plus and have zero electrons. Uh, it can also gain an electron and become H minus, the ion, and have a, a full shell. But what it actually does most commonly is it interacts with another molecule, like maybe another molecule of hydrogen, or another atom, I'm sorry, of hydrogen, and those two electrons are shared between both. Another way that we draw that is with this line. And what that means is the electrons are shared. And if they're shared, they actually count in both atoms octets. Yeah, did you have a question? Okay. They, they're shared in both atoms octets, or not octets, in both atoms valence shells. So hydro the hydrogen on the left, we say it has two valence electrons now. The hydrogen on the right, we say it also has two valence electrons now. So they both get to use those electrons, and they're shared. And so this thing is called a covalent bond. And think about what that word is, covalent. Co meaning together, valent, like the valence electrons. So they're both, co both valencies are together sharing these electrons. Um, and whenever we draw a line in chemistry to indicate a bond between two atoms, this is always what it represents. A line always represents, a solid line always represents a covalent bond of two electrons. And you probably looked at this a little bit on Tuesday when you did the models, talking about how many bonds certain atoms like versus other atoms. Um, and this is, again, some more practice with where that comes from. So if we look at an atom like oxygen, how many valence electrons again in oxygen? Six. And so we might say that it has space 
to share two electrons with other atoms. We just saw in the ionic that it can also accept those two electrons. But what if it shares it? Well, we can imagine this interacting with two hydrogen atoms, sharing those two. And now everybody's happy. The oxygen has its eight, and each hydrogen has its two. And then another way we can draw that is by using those lines. Now one thing to note here is that there are going to be four electrons that aren't involved in the bond. You see those? They started as valence electrons of oxygen. They didn't really do anything when we bond with the hydrogen, so they're still there. We have names for those, too. Those are called lone pairs or non-bonding electrons. They're electrons that don't interact in the covalent bonds. They're still there, and they're part of the structures. When we draw these types of structures, anybody know what they're called? These are called Lewis structures. And you can actually figure out how they're going to look and how you're going to draw them by knowing the valence electrons and matching them up accordingly. Now, a couple of things you should know about these, and then we'll get into this activity. These only generally work for non-metals, atoms that aren't metals. How do you know if an atom is a metal or not? You can check the periodic table. What, how, how do you check it? What, what do you look for? Anybody know this one? What? Are all, the all the Bs are metals. That's true. And there's some more also. Do you see this darkened staircase that kind of goes between 5 and 13 and winds its way down? That's at the approximate boundary. Anything to the left is a metal. Anything to the right is not. There are some exceptions, but that's a good rule of thumb. Um, hydrogen is the main exception. Hydrogen uh, is, is not a metal. But anything else around there can generally be taken to be a metal. Okay. What do metals do if they don't do this? They do the ionic bonding. So metals tend to transfer electrons. Nonmetals tend to share electrons with each other. So, if you, so that's a good way to know if you are trying to figure out how the bonding is working out in a structure, look for a metal. If there's a metal and a nonmetal, it's probably ionic. If there are two nonmetals or more nonmetals, it's probably covalent. So rather than talk about a whole bunch more of this, um, I'm going to pass this out. There's this activity there. All right, let's look at these two structures. The first one, CH2O, and, and then the second one, C2H2. Um, in both cases, the errors that I saw were, I think, slightly errors of pride, if I may put it that way, where you sort of thought that you would take a couple steps forward and just go for um, doing it. And, 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 you, and when you step back and actually did it using the same procedure, you ended up getting the right answer. So let's look at, let's look at what I would call the slow way of doing this. The slow way of doing this is to look at each atom with its valence electrons drawn out as you've been doing. All right. 
And then you can kind of identify holes or places where electrons want to get paired up. And you did this throughout. So you, you know that oxygen kind of has two holes where it wants more electrons. Carbon has four. Hydrogen has one. Another way of saying that is that that's how many bonds they can form or how many bonds they want to form. And if you pair all these things up, the only way it really works is if you put the carbon here, sharing with the hydrogen, sharing with the hydrogen, and then it's got its two here, and oxygen's got its extra two, and those actually share together. And if those are all shared together, then everything works out. Another way to express that might be to have the oxygen kind of right here. Oops, that's not going to give me enough room. And say that these are all sharing all four of those instead of just two. And if you count that out, it works out. The carbon, if you count all the ones it's sharing, the carbon has eight. Uh, if you count the oxygen, I didn't. Uh, put its others up here. If you count the oxygen, that all has eight. And if you count the hydrogens, they have two. So everything works. Now we transfer it into the line type formula, recognizing that each line indicates two electrons being shared. So anytime two electrons are shared, we draw a line. That means C with the H and the H. And so what do we draw to the O then? Two lines, because there's four electrons being shared. And what do we call that? That's called a double bond, a double bond. And that's the only way you can get this one to work out, is by drawing that double bond. Um, and this is kind of something to note whenever you're doing these types of problems where you have to draw the Lewis structure. Whenever something's not really working out, it seems like you can't get enough electrons around something, chances are it's because you need to actually have a double or triple bond, more sharing than just two. So let's look at the next one, same thing. If you didn't try to mess with the electrons, if you didn't look at the electrons, you might come up with something like this. You know, it takes care of all the atoms. You've got two hydrogens and two carbons. But the problem is that the electrons aren't expressed properly here. You don't, the carbons don't have eight electrons around them. In fact, each only has four. So instead of doing it that way, let's once again draw the dots out and say, all right, I'm going to share these two between carbon and hydrogen, these two between carbon and hydrogen. And then the only way to get everything satisfied is to actually share all three of these between the two carbons. So there's going to actually be three bonds between those carbons. And the right way to express this is, is like that, which is called a triple bond. Uh, yes. There are some examples of quadruple bonds in metals, but uh, not in, in nonmetals. No. So the most there will be is three. What? That was the trick I was talking about. So if you tried to do it the way that it did in the paper and you didn't realize that you could share more than two, it wouldn't have worked out. You had to realize that you can actually share more than two, and that's sort of the trick. Maybe it wasn't that tricky, but. Um. OK. So this is something, I, I told you I'd try to be pretty clear about this. This is something you should definitely be able to do um, come exam time, is draw these types of structures from the formulas um, using this procedure that we've just practiced a bunch. It's a really important way that we communicate uh, chemically. If I draw C2H2 and I tell you to go get some C2H2, you need to know what that structure is um, so you can do some chemistry on it so we can talk about things. So it's really just a, a language thing, a communication thing. Does anybody know what the names of these molecules are? Have you seen it, them before? The first one is formaldehyde, and the second one is acetylene. It's a gas it's used for welding. Formaldehyde is used for preserving things like um, animals and you know stuff in biology lab and, and so forth. It's also, it's, I mean, it has wide uses in all kinds of stuff. It's used as a treatment for clothing, um, especially if you have like non-iron clothes. They often have a formaldehyde residue from manufacturing. That's why you're always supposed to wash them before you wear it, because you can absorb that through the skin. And formaldehyde is a carcinogen. 
most preservation now it doesn't use formaldehyde. It uses formalin, which is a variant that's not a carcinogen. Or maybe less of a carcinogen. I don't really know. All right, so do you feel pretty good about these sorts of things, maybe? OK, keep doing some practice. This is where it's nice to have a book around. I told you you can get some, some cheap ones online if you look for older used copies. They have a lot of problems like this. If you look up practicing Lewis structures online, you can get a lot of practice there as well. So with our remaining time, I want to actually talk about, now that we've made the Lewis structures, how to abbreviate them and write them even easier and faster. And this is going to work primarily with organic compounds. <coughs> what do I mean by organic structures? Yeah, things that are mostly carbon based. Or to be more specifically to be more specific, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. They can have some other stuff in there too, but most of everything in an organic compound is carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. And those are the things that make up life, that make up plants, that make up us, that make up uh, other living things. Now, you've worked with some organic stuff already. Um, the biodiesel molecules, those would all be considered organic molecules. The stuff you built on Tuesday, butane and isobutane and stuff, those are organic molecules. And we can actually abbreviate organic structures because they bond very predictably and regularly. So we've talked about this al already. How many, or I don't know we've talked about it, but you've probably seen it. How many bonds do you expect carbon to form? Four. Yeah. Oops. And actually, that's a pretty hard and fast rule. Um, regular carbon-containing compounds will have four bonds. Carbons will have four bonds. What about oxygen? Two. What about hydrogen? One. Nitrogen? Three. Now, that's not always going to be the case. Um, of course, there are always exceptions. But in the vast majority of cases, this is true. And we can use that to abbreviate some things. So let me show you the, the two ways that we abbreviate organic structures using these rules. Let's take the molecule hexane. Hexane is a solvent, uses a fuel sometimes. Um, if you've heard of uh, white gas or white spirits, it's sort of like Coleman fuel, that has a lot of hexane in it. It's a very volatile uh, organic solvent. And the structure of hexane, if we draw the Lewis structure, well, the formula, let's start with the formula. The formula of hexane is C6H14. Okay, we're going to call that, well, we're not going to, it is called the molecular formula. And that tells us how many of each type of atom are in the compound. <laughs> But as you probably noticed doing the models on Tuesday, that doesn't tell us the structure. There are actually several different ways we can make Lewis structures that have six carbons and 14 hydrogens. So let's talk about one of them, which is when they're all lined up, kind of the simplest one. You're going to have six carbons in a row. And since each carbon has to have four bonds, there are going to be as many hydrogens as can fit around it. OK. Now, as you're writing that, that's taking you a little bit of, of time to write. It took me a little bit of time to write, too. And this is actually a small organic molecule, a small hydrocarbon, only six carbons. We routinely deal with organic molecules that have 20 or 50 carbons in it. And if we had to write them all out like this, it would be extremely tedious and take up a lot of paper and uh, you know, it would be annoying. So this is the Lewis structure. 
what we just did. If you went and did all the dots on carbon and hydrogen and everything, this might be what you come up with also. But we want ways to abbreviate this that still tell us how these things are connected. We can't just say C6H14 because you could kind of branch this off in different ways and make different C6H14s. So we have to abbreviate this in a way that actually um, still tells us the structural information. And there are two ways we do that. The first one is called a condensed structure, and it looks like this. There are actually two ways we can condense it. One is like this. So it still shows that all the carbons are in a line. And just after each carbon is the number of hydrogens that are connected to that carbon. Do you see how that equals that? Or is that, that is the same that expresses that? OK. And then there's a way we can condense this even more. like that. So now we're saying you've got a CH3, so a carbon with three hydrogens, then four CH2s in a row, and then a CH3 again on the end. So again, same thing, even shorter. And those are known as condensed formula or the condensed structure. And then there's a way to draw this even faster. And that's what we're going to focus on for the next 15 minutes or so. And that's called the line structure. And that's all it is. And this is how most organic structures are communicated, um, whether it's in the literature, um, when we're drawing stuff, when we're writing stuff. If we know how to use these types of structures, it'll make our lives a whole lot easier. So let's take it apart and, and talk about what's going on here. There's our line structure of hexane. So in a line structure, you have a couple rules. One, you assume that there are carbon atoms at each end and vertex. So anytime you have an end of a line or a line changes direction or connects, you assume there's a carbon atom there. That means that we're going to have carbon atoms here, 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 and here, six carbon atoms, just like the hexane above. Did you see that? OK. Second part, second rule. We're going to assume enough hydrogens to fill the valences of carbon. So what does that mean? Well, there's no hydrogen atoms drawn here. So we have to just assume that they're there. So how many, how many hydrogen atoms do we assume are on this carbon? Three, because the carbon has one bond going to the other carbon. And that means there must be three hydrogens to fill its four bonds because hydrogen always needs four bonds, right? So there's got to be three hydrogens on that carbon. What about on this one? Two hydrogens here, and then all of these interior ones will have two. And then three hydrogens again on the end. So we assume there are enough hydrogens to fill everything. And then the third rule is that you leave other atoms alone. 
So we don't take the hydrogens off of oxygen or nitrogen or whatever else happens to be out there. Those are all expressed as, as is. All right. So that's the rules. Let's practice now and see some different variations of this and see if you can get um, a little bit comfortable working with these structures. Should I leave those up here? So first, I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to draw a line structure. And I'm going to ask you to come up with the formula for it and the Lewis structure, the full Lewis structure. Yeah? Will these always only be hydrogen and carbon? No. Like no. Hydrogen and oxygen be right. And that's the example we'll see there. So when you have. You have to know the formula before you draw No, because of number three. Nitrogen and oxygen will always show up as is in the line structure. They're not abbreviated. So let me show you an example of that. Here's a line structure of a molecule. So first, convert this to a Lewis structure. That is, draw all the lines and all the hydrogens and everything out. And then uh, give me the formula as well. Remember, follow those rules. You've got carbon atoms at each end and vertex. So anytime you've got a change of direction or two things coming together, that's a carbon atom. You assume there are enough hydrogens so that carbons always have four bonds. And then other atoms are left alone, like this oxygen is still OH. We don't take the hydrogen off of that to abbreviate it. So give that a try. Work together and see if you can come up with the Lewis structure for this and the formula for this. I'll come around to So what I'm going to do first is, if there's sort of a technique to doing this, um, is first lay out the carbon skeleton. That is, where are the carbons going to be? And remember, we said that the carbons are always at the vertices. So here, 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 and here. I'm going to lay that out first. So we've got C, 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 C. And those two are, have a double bond between them. Okay, And then you've got the OH up here. which doesn't change. That's the same way it's, it's written. Then you're going to fill in the hydrogens so that each carbon has a full octet, meaning how many bonds? Four bonds per carbon. So let's put in those hydrogens. And, and go carbon to carbon so you don't miss any. I saw a lot of people missing one of them. So this carbon, how many bonds does it have already? Three, right? One, two, three. So how many hydrogens does it need? One. And what about this one? Same. And this one? This one needs two because it only has two bonds without them. Now it's got four. Okay, and same here. And then what about this one? One. So that's the full Lewis structure for this molecule. And that means that the molecular formula is what? C5. H8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, O. Or you could also write this C5H7OH if you want to um, preserve the idea that the O and the H are together. That's fine. Okay, let's try another one. So you sort of get the idea of how this works now? OK. All right, this one's a bit bigger. Let's try that one. Nice job. Let's try a little bit easier one. <laughs> Some of you actually got it totally right, but um, that, was, that, was my, that was my fault for throwing that one out at you first. I, I just didn't think we'd have time to get to it. Let's try a slightly easier one first. So how would you draw a line structure of oops, this compound? It's another ring.
What does that line structure look like? It's just a square, yeah. That's what the line structure is. Did everybody see that? How those compare to each other? OK. Now let's try this one. Sometimes I'll, I'll abbreviate them with um, the H is still next to the C's, but we can still make this even a shorter abbreviation if we need to. So let's look at this one. Now you have a chain of how many carbons? What's the longest chain that you can draw here? The longest chain is six carbons. It's this kind of right here, right? One, two, three, four, whoops, not six, five. How did I come up with six? I don't know. This is almost the end of class. And I, my brain's shutting off, too. Um, or we could alternatively do this one, which is also five carbons. Any way you look at it, the longest continuous chain is five, right? So that means that when we draw a line structure, we're going to draw five carbons in a row. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> and it might help to actually number those. One, two, three, four, five. And what else do we have to draw to complete this then? Yeah, we need to account for this other one here, which is one more carbon. Um, and it's connected to carbon number two, right? So that's it. That's the end of our line structure. So having looked at those couple, let's go back to this tricky one up here. And let's take it apart bit by bit. First of all, let's, let's break this down into some parts. So you've got this kind of left part that's connected to each other. And then over on the right, you have these long chains. And this is a triglyceride. Um, this is or a, fatty, or a fat or an oil, lipid, various terms like that. Um, let's first d deal with the part on the right, which are these long carbon chains. So if we're going to draw a zigzag line, how many verti vertices do we need to account for this chain right here? Well, yeah. So 12 or 13. 12 for these, and then one for this carbon over here. Um, so let's do that. I'll get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then we'll say that the 13th one has this double bond to oxygen, another oxygen, and then over to the CH2. Okay. So you got that part so far? Now let's go to the next one. How many do we need in the next one? In fact, let's, let's start with this part. And then how many do we need from here? Eight, right? Seven of these and one more here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. OK. And then let's look at this bottom one. Again, we have that O with the carbon double bond O. And then what do we need here? We need, this is a little weird. So we need three, and then this double bond, and then four more at the end. So let's do three. One, two, three. That's going to be these three. And then there's a double bond between four and five. So four, five. There's our double bond. And then we've got four more. Six, seven, eight, nine. Now let's deal with the other side. We have three carbons that are all connected together and connected to the oxygens. So we can just go like this. And that's the proper line structure for that very complex uh, molecule. All right. Now to check yourself when you do these, it can always be helpful to number things off. So if you know that you need 12 here, 
we can number that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, just to make sure we've got everything. And you can do that for each one. Sometimes that's helpful, or just do it with your finger or whatever to make sure you've got enough carbons. That's certainly a tricky one to do. All right, I'll be posting some stuff on Blackboard for practice with this. Um, we will we'll end there. Next Thursday, we're going to have a short quiz on this stuff. So the quiz will be on Lewis structures and on line structures. Just a few questions to see how your studying is going. So make sure you practice up on that uh, over the week. And then make sure that you print out the labs so you're prepared on Tuesday. Have your labs printed out and your notebooks, or you might not be able to do the lab. Thanks. And read the articles for Thursday, yeah. I'll try to post a reminder about that, too.